Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Tinnitus TV. Today, I am talking to Whitehorse. You know, country music is full of couples. You've got Johnny and June, George and Tammy, Faith and Tim, and now Luke and Melissa, as in Luke Doucette and Melissa McClelland of this Canadian Roots outfit. In case you haven't heard, they've gone full on country on their latest album, the wonderfully named I'm Not Crying, You're Crying which tones down the rockier elements of their sound and embraces the authentic Nashville torch and twang of the 70s. But this isn't just some slavish tribute to the past. All those vintage sounding tracks are topped with contemporary lyrics about the pandemic, aliens, the RCMP, and more. A few days after the album came out, Luke and Melissa zoomed in from their Winnipeg home to chat about their new direction, the hardships of being a working musician, who's in the driver's seat in their relationship, and more. Enjoy. Let's talk about what we're here to talk about, which is your new album, uh, I'm Not Crying, You're Crying. You guys went for the, the Friday the 13th album release, so I'm presuming you're not superstitious. I no. didn't even realize until the day of when I looked at my calendar, I'm like, ooh, <laughs> this should be spicy. But <laughs> we're, not, we're not superstitious, so <laughs> all good. That's good. So, so now that it's out, how do you feel? Are are you relieved? Are you anxious? Are are you are you looking and uh, listening to it and going, ah, you know what? We should have done this and we should have done that. What's the what's the mood? I think relief is such a good description. Uh, unfortunately, I, I agree. With <laughs> yeah, this. I mean, it's maybe not the most flattering. I'm just gonna get a, the, the, the kettle off the stove, uh, the but kettle, I'm listening. I'm the with kettle you is calling. <laughs> um, you know, when you when you put out a record. The, the first response that you get that first day kind of sets the tone for the whole release in, in a certain way. Um, so yeah, I mean, we put a lot into every uh, album that we make. So there is a bit of like, you know, holding your breath until you kind of see how people respond to it. And of course with, uh, you know, two years of, of not doing much touring and we did release records, but it was a different kind of uh, release you know, because everything was so different and quiet and kind of, you know, not really happening. So, you know, this one felt even more important than anything else we've released because we're, we're trying to step back into the world, trying to step back into the, the life that we were living um, three years ago. And uh, so, yeah, to put that record out and have such a great response from, from everyone, um, all the all the fans that have listened and the reviews that we've we've had it's just a, a big big sigh of relief and it feels like we can move forward with with some ease i mean really the the all, all we're hoping for other than complete global domination is that we get <laughs> to spend another year or two being a band because the there's been a feeling and is it because of I mean, there's so many things and we, we tend to focus on the pandemic, but really I think the legacy of the pandemic has been that people are feeling alienated and confused and fearful of the future and uncertain about finances and uncertain about culture and what are people supposed to do and feel and think. And, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of that that persists. And I don't want to say that's because of COVID, it, it, COVID played a role, but it just, we're just in a, I think we're in a, in a fairly seismic readjustment period in life in, in the Western world that we're probably not even all entirely aware of. And, and so that gave us a feeling of sort of an apocalyptic feeling like, you know, this thing about us being on the road and playing our song, playing stupid songs about our feelings, like those days are over. This is over. This whole, this whole run of being songwriters and in, in, in low rent rock and roll bands is over. And, and now the record comes out and people are saying such effusive things about it and it's making us feel like oh well maybe maybe we get to be a band for another year or two that'd be great that'd be amazing and so that's kind of that's really what it boils down to it's like holy shit we get to keep playing music maybe <laughs> well good fingers crossed uh i mean but also i was you know when i was listening to it i was kind of struck by the fact that so many of the emotions that are going on and that, that are pandemic related seem to uh, cross over just perfectly and, and dovetail with with country music I mean, it's kind of funny that nobody's really kind of explored that that specific topic before the way you guys have. Well, people, I, you know, when we were talking about the fact that we had made this 
that we'd done all this recording because we, we made four records in the last couple of years and and people have sort of expressed a bit of like oh my god like how where did you find the time i'm like what what have you had other than time <laughs> like what are you doing with your time and and i would forgive people we would forgive people for merely surviving like it's been a weird couple of years but you know it does feel like the sky is falling and uh we, we are estranged or alienated from the people that we love we're, we're not even supposed to have contact with people that we don't even really know like the, the the general hustle and bustle of being in a city and like bumping up against somebody on the subway and oh we can't do that either can't cover our faces and you know to me there's so much to write about like this the like there's so many different ways of writing about alienation and loneliness i mean isn't that aren't those the bedrocks of 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 folk music and country music and you know, and country music is prone to a bit of hyperbole and simplifying things, distilling things down to their bare, simple, basic essence. And don't overthink it. There's so much to say. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just find it's, it's, it's a little bit baffling to me. No, it's not baffling. Nothing's baffling. But I, 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 it's been, what am I trying to say? It hasn't been hard to find poignant small things to say mm -hmm. there just seems like an endless trove of, of things but and and i do think you're right i feel like the the genre of of you know this kind of old school country that we tapped into mm. really allowed for us to tell those stories or bring certain characters to life in a way that i don't think we would have been able to accomplish with if we were working within a different genre we could have you know told stories about you know similar themes but it would have there was something about this style of country where I personally felt like I could really emote in a certain way that I wouldn't that wouldn't really that I wouldn't feel that kind of freedom to do in a different genre so I had a lot of fun writing some of these songs and like bringing some of the characters to life um, and it was really unintentional um, you know John Prine passed away and you know, that kind of got us in the headspace of, of listening to those kinds of records and Kenny Rogers and Kenny Rogers. And yeah, when Kenny Rogers passed away, we did a, a cover of Islands in the Stream just in our kitchen. And it was like one of the first things we posted during lockdown. Um, so, yeah, we, we started kind of connecting to that that style of music and then the writing started hap to happen. Um, but it did ultimately become kind of the, the perfect fit for what we were doing. Right. And what was what's the division of labor like for you guys when you're writing? I mean, is it is it is there a set kind of one person does this, one person does that, or is it all kind of everybody's doing everything? We we write separately, typically. Like we we have co-written songs before and obviously we collaborate in, in every conceivable way, but right. um yeah, um uh, with this record and with most of our records, we, you know, we kind of go into separate corners of the house and we work on our batch of songs. Luke was actually in like a really prolific headspace at this time. And we'd put our son Jimmy to bed and he, I would go upstairs and kind of do my thing. And Luke would sit in the kitchen, the bottle of wine and a guitar. And he started writing all these songs. Um, and I would wake up in the morning and, and he would have sent me a, a demo, just like a rough voice memo from his phone. So I'd wake up and listen to this brand new song that he had. And, and I felt like that part of my brain really shut down when we went into lockdown. The creative part of my brain just kind of was like, nope, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> and uh, so when he started sending me these songs, I was like, these are fantastic. These are beautiful. These are moving. Um, and I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta get on board. I gotta get, get with the program. So I kind of re reignited that part of my brain, picked up the guitar, and uh, if the loneliness don't kill me was the first song that I wrote after looking in our recycling box and seeing all the the empty bottles piling up. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so typically we, it's a very solitary process for us, and then we come together and and pick the songs that make the most sense um although like once we get in the studio we really do collaborate oh for sure and, and that does include like there are songs where it's like ah, i don't know if this verse is is really working and our sort of policy in the band is if if i don't if i think one of the verses in melissa's song 
isn't as strong as it should be, then it's incumbent upon me to suggest how to fix it. And so we have that relationship where she'll be like, I don't, I think, I think the melody's kind of lame in the bridge. And I'm like, okay, well, what, what do you think? And then she'll come up with something. And so we do end up co-writing. Yeah, absolutely. Not, you know, we, we write alone and then we edit each other's work very much together. And then we get in the studio and, and if we're producing ourselves, which we've done a fair bit lately and, and including on this record, then, you know, usually I think, back to your question about the division of labor, which I think is a really good way of putting it. I tend to have my head under the hood and I'm tinkering with the carburetor or trying to fix the fan or whatever. And Melissa's sort of standing back 50 feet and going, you know, we actually shouldn't even be on this highway. We should be way over there. And I'm busy trying to figure out how best to navigate the snowbank. And she's like, no, no, we're going the wrong way. So it, there's a micro and a macro perspective. Right. It, when it comes to production and and we both take on different roles like i i sort of steered us towards this country thing at as a, at, from the writing perspective and then sometimes in the studio she steers us in a different direction so we we do right and this was very from the very beginning of our relationship we we both realized that we bring very different things to the table you know mm -hmm. at, and and it's really fortuitous because we could just be redundant like well we're both really we're, we're, we're both massive Chrissy Hine fans, oh, well, we're both going to write, write pretender songs and that's just how it's going to go. Well, it's not really like that. Like right. I'm really a fan of, of <clears throat> Dwight Yoakam and, and Lyle Lovett and Melissa leans more on the Patsy Cline and the, and the Loretta Lynn. And that's a really great place. There's a, there's a lot of, there's, there's lots in between. Yeah. Well, I mean, listening to Sanity, Tennessee, I could hear the Patsy Cline uh, <laughs> in that. So, um, Talking about the, the the actual sound of the instruments and the recording, I mean, a lot of it is very has that very old school Nashville Studio A Quonset Hut sound. Um, was that uh, difficult to achieve? Is is the gear that you use kind of critical to getting that sound, or is it all just you can do it with anything? That's a really good question. I'm not even sure that I know the answer. We've only done this once i mean there's an ep of covers that we're also going to release at some point that's apparently a secret but um <laughs> what is critical i think in terms of gear is that is to establish guardrails and to stick to them like in our case we cut the drums and the pedal steel off the floor at the same time when we were recording the songs so we were like in a studio together and we were like arranging the songs like you would in an old school record in, in the 70s in nashville like the four people in the band are all standing around together talking about the arrangement and then you cut it somebody's singing the lead vocal maybe it's melissa maybe it's me depending on the song one of us is playing the guitar and then the, the drums and the pedal steel are happening all together and once we get a take that we like you know usually it requires playing the song four or five times until we're really happy with the performance and by then we've got four or five passes of the pedal steel so we can go and grab spots from a different you know but we tried to keep it to those things like no keyboard overdubs no organs no percussion no choirs no violins no mandolins we didn't want to overload it we wanted to keep it so that it sounded like it could happen off off a bandstand you know that was right. that was so, so in terms of the, the gear and the production style, it was important to limit ourselves to those things. I used pretty much the same amplifier, a 66 Deluxe Reverb and virtually no pedals. And I played my Falcon, a Telecaster, an SG for one or two songs and a Firebird. And that's it. We used the same Martin guitar on all the acoustics pretty much. We, Melissa and I sang vocals. We very rarely did we put a third vocal part. Usually it's just the two of us. Occasionally we do a third, but for the most part it's like, let's keep it to just the two yeah. of us. So we restricted ourselves to elements that we thought belonged in the era and off the stage. And, and we wanted to keep it simple. We wanted to have one arm tied behind our backs. It was really nice to simplify because I don't think we've ever really approached recording that way. Um, even, you know, in performance for the first seven years of, of White Horse, we were looping. And so it was all about like layering and, and different sounds and different layers of sounds. <laughs> and, you know, when we get into a, the studio, we have a lot of fun uh, dressing a song up and and sky's the limit, right? You can, you can do this, you can do that. You can try it this way, try it that way. Um, so to really simplify was, Pretty, pretty amazing. And I thought, you know, I thought it was going to be easy because of that. Oh, and, it, and it was not because we had to put so much care and focus on the vocals and the guitars. So we spent more time than we've ever spent on any record, just getting the right vocals, getting the right guitar parts. Every little part had to be mm -hmm. perfect. 
because you know there was all this space there wasn't much else going on so but you're also standing on the shoulders of giants when you put very specific guardrails around the music that tend to be nashville in the 70s I and mean, you're, you're 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 comparing yourselves to the greatest of the great you're comparing yourself at that point it's it's it's, it's albert lee and it's james burton and it's buddy emmons and, and it's paul franklin and it's 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 emmy lou harris and it's it's dolly parton and it's Ronstadt, like the, these are the people that you're going to get compared to when you when you put on a hat that's that specific. People are like, okay, well, how does it sound against Trio? How does it sound against Ahern's production? Brian Ahern was Emmy Lou's husband for six or seven years, but also he produced all of her records in the '70s and a bunch of Anne Murray stuff. He's actually from Nova Scotia, maybe you know this. Right. But anyway, you're 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 saying, hey, we want to be, we want you to listen to our records at the same time as you're listening to Graham Parsons, and. That's a, that's big. That's hard, and and you people people tend to, like in the in the folk rock world, as the sort of indie folk rock landscape becomes more treacherous, and the radio is hard to come by. It's hard to make a living. It's hard to figure out where you stand or why I bother. A lot of sort of indie folk rock artists will end up kind of pretending to make country music because it's like, hey, that's country. Look at us, hee haw, and they put on a hat. But it's 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 kind of bullshit, and and we were really aware of the risk because what what pedigree do we have that you know we're from Manitoba or Ontario and and we're not from the we're not we're not ranchers like Cor, like Corb Lund's family or like Coulter Wall we're, we're not you know we're my mom is a nurse and Melissa's dad was in finance like that's that's our, those are our backgrounds, um, so we were just really really careful about wanting to be wanting to be sincere and listen really hard to those records to those to those guy clark records and john prine and, and chris christopherson and we just you know i don't know we got our heads deep up the ass of that thing <laughs> it worked i mean you've cha you channel it really well and, and the thing i love about it too is that the lyrics on top of it are, are in a lot of ways way more contemporary you know, there aren't a lot of 70s uh, country songs about extraterrestrials and, and some of the other, you know, things you kind of touch on and flit around in here. So it's, it's nice to, to see that, that you're paying, uh, you're paying homage to it, but, but it's not slavish, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, Thank that's you. Nice that's to hear. That's our high praise because we, we were, we were prepared, like waiting with bated breath for somebody to call us dilettantes and phonies. We're like, fuck, what are we going to do? <laughs> No, you've obviously put way too much effort into it to be to be dilettantes on <laughs> it. Uh, did did you guys uh, have you been watching the uh, the George and and Tammy uh, miniseries that was on? Oh, no, I need to watch that. I need to see that. It's pretty yeah. weird. I mean, Michael Michael Shannon plays George Jones, and and once you get over the fact that he doesn't look a damn thing like George Jones, even slightly, right. his acting carries it. But it's it's interesting because they they do all their own singing. Oh, who plays Tammy Wynette? Uh, 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 Chastain, uh, what's her name? Uh, oh, oh I so love good. her. I, I didn't even know this thing existed. I, my, I'm television illiterate. I didn't know, I didn't, I don't know. This yeah, we got to watch this. Is this a Netflix thing? I have no idea. Is it, is it uh, Netflix? HBO, I think, or Crave, uh, oh. one of those. You can find okay. it. Uh, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's been, been on my list. Right, well, because I was just thinking about, about, you know, uh, country couples where you've got, uh, you know, again, George and uh, George and Tammy, or, or or Johnny and June, or even and Graham and Emmy Lou, and in yeah. all those relationships, it always seems that the the guy is kind of a, 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 a almost somewhere between a savant and a screw up, and the woman <laughs> is the one holding it together, the long suffering woman. Yeah, I, I just <laughs> wanted to you know remind you of anyone. Uh, that give me a pass to be a complete <laughs> maniac. <laughs> I mean, I've always, what I've observed, and it was actually the Mike Judge uh, trails from the tour bus that, that put it really into focus. How many of these pred predominantly male, you know, like basically just like knock down drag out hillbillies from Eastern Kentucky who all of a sudden become rock stars or country stars, lot, nothing but money. And they just disintegrate into a hail of bullets, tears and cocaine. And it's just, it's so messy. It's mm -hmm. unbelievable how messy it is. And you're right. These women are just like, okay, how do I hold you together? How do I keep you from killing yourself? And I mean, I, you know, who knows if that narrative is always accurate, but I think you're right. Like, I think that sounds is sounds exhausting. I mean, it's kind of what life is like. <laughs> it's true. I don't think, yeah, I don't think it's limited to country music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a reason a doghouse is a euphemism that's used about men. There's no such thing as the woman doghouse. 
<laughs> very true. Very true. That house, if they're misbehaving. <laughs> so, so uh, you mentioned an EP. I presume then there's more where this came from. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> Did you only write the 12 songs that appear on this album or were there a lot of uh, orphans and leftovers? You know, there's orphans and leftovers like crazy, but if there were to be something to follow this record, and I have no idea what you're talking about, but it might be covers. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. And no, we'll if, if, if you were going to Other... speculate on people you might in, a, in an alternate universe cover, what might some of their names be? <laughs> You know, well, they, the names have come up in this yeah, conversation we're, already. We're um, we're more predictable than we uh, would like to be. Yeah, just you know, some of the greats. There's there's a lot of good yeah. stuff to, to pick from. I think when in and around the recording of "I'm Not Crying, You're Crying," when we were dabbling in covers and playing other people's music, um, we were trying to figure out what what we could relate to and what we what we could feel sincere and authentic doing you know so we, we we stuck pretty close the the, the things that, that that we were talking about and this the artists that have obviously motivated a lot of these songs those are the those are the ones we we've leaned on you know in future years we if we're lucky enough to to, to get to play country music again and can continue to do so which i hope we do mm -hmm. um we'll probably um dive into deeper waters and and be more nuanced about it we're gonna have to stop leaning so hard on graham and emmy lou maybe <laughs> Oh, they're they're worth leaning on. Uh, and that album title, were you watching the Starsky and Hutch movie at the time you were doing this or what? No, it, it sort of came almost like in a fever dream, like, oh, my God, wouldn't that be amazing? But it turned out to be a really controversial suggestion. We had a number of meetings with our label. Shauna was concerned that it would sound too much like a disposable meme, like just well, sort of like a contemporary it, like 2020 meme, like people are going to roll their eyes at it and it's going to seem dated. I mean, that's kind of why I like it, though, because because it when you read it, it just, I'm not crying, you're crying. It's, it sounds like an old school country record, but we have this new meaning to that phrase. Um, and, you know, that kind of represents the record in a certain way, like what, what you were talking about. It has this old school sound, but it, but it is modern in ways as well. So I, I like the kind of play on that. But um, yeah, we weren't totally sure. It took us a while no. to kind of land on that. But I mean, I'm glad we did. the thing is heart, heartache and, and loss and, and isolation, alienation and sadness and unrequited love, like those themes, they're classic themes. They're also things that I think were brought really to the fore in, in the last few years of watching society readjust around a whole bunch of things. Like those things are um, touchstones. And, you know, and, and, and we, we often describe the process of coming up with these narratives. Like we went out into the world with our alter egos, with our capes and our shiny tights and our, our, um, our masks and we collected a bunch of stories as alter egos and, and brought them back into the fold as if they were our own. And, um, you know, the, a lot of that stuff is universal. And um, yeah, I guess that's all. <laughs> all right. I, I was kind of surprised to see that you weren't already uh, out on the road behind this. Uh, you're waiting till spring to really kind of kick into gear. Um, that must be frustrating, I would think. Well, it's been, a, it's been a lot of years of being frustrated around not working as much as we want. So at this point, we're prepared to take it slow and, and, and figure things out. We, we have some work to do. Where did we go? We, we did a tour. Oh, we went and did a Western thing before the record came out. Yeah. So yeah. We're going to the UK in a couple of days for right. Americana. Right. Um, so we do have a, a few things, but um, yeah, I mean, touring is, is really tricky these days. So, um, you know, pre-pandemic, we were on the road all the time. Go, go, go no problem. And it's not so easy anymore. So we have to be very strategic and careful about when we leave the house to play music and uh, what that's going to mean financially yeah. and, and health wise and everything. There are so many are things. You, to are, 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 are you intending to take a band? Well, as, 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 to, to Melissa's point, yes, of course, if we can, if it. That's what we, what we desperately want to do is bring the band that played on the record. We want to bring Bert mm -hmm. Carroll and we want to bring John Albersi in and we will when we can. But, you know, the, the, the reality is, I mean, you, you've probably seen in the headlines the last couple of days, the Vancouver Folk Music Festival and, and Squamish, Constellation and Squamish are, are both either confirmed to be shutting down or almost shutting oh down. Oh my God, I did not hear that. Yeah, both of those. Wow. Both of those are gone under. That's massive. Those that's are the, awful. Those two two of the biggest festivals on the West Coast are, are like, that's it, tits up, gone. So, 
we have to wow. be really careful. And, and we've often erred on the side of like, you know what, let's make, like, we just want to play with the band because that's what's fun. Let's do it. And then we come home after six months of touring and we've got a hundred thousand dollar credit card debt. We're like, this is crazy. We're going to bankrupt ourselves and festivals are not able to sustain themselves. So, yeah. so I know a lot of it's tough out there. artists, tough have, out there. Yeah, a lot of people are, are having to reckon with the fact that, it, that the, the, the economic landscape is, is more complicated than we thought. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of you know, it used to be that you could make some money from recordings, but you would still make most of your money on the road. And then obviously, nobody makes any money from recordings now, and and now nobody yeah. can make any money on the road. It seems. I mean, I, I saw you guys have a patron page. Does that kind of help uh, fill in the gaps? Are there other kind of creative things you do to kind of, you know, a, a little bit, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here, a little bit there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, all the sources of income for musicians are just dwindling now. Like there's no real main source of, of income. That's a real problem. You know, yeah. there are a lot of artists out there who are, are seemingly doing well, you know, that the optics look mm-hmm. good, but uh, mm-hmm. at the end, yeah. it's, uh, and you know, a lot of these problems might be because of this post pandemic climate. Um, but it's also just, you know, the industry is, is a little bit broken to begin with. So yeah, we're, we're, we're finding our way, but it feels good to have music out there. And all we want to do is be on a stage and play it for people. That's all we want to do. And if that fails, then Canada Post is probably hiring. I hope. Fingers crossed. Uh, hey, you're turning 50 this year, aren't you? Yes. Are you ready? Totally ready. <laughs> I'm ready. Um, I have my, my helmet uh, and my elbow pads. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I've, I've, been, I've been ready. I've, I thought of myself as 40 years old from the time I was 15. I, <laughs> I was going to say, you were born 50. I've been a middle-aged man my whole <laughs> life. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. Do I care? I guess I, think I care. we're gonna I care. we're gonna be on the road. We're gonna be in, yeah. in the U.S. playing some small shows. We might be in Chicago. Yeah, yeah we'll we'll plan something good. Yeah, that's good. It doesn't yeah. just doesn't mean as much to me maybe as it as I as it should. I'm one of those people who forgets that everybody else is going through the same thing. It's like, wow, look at me. I'm turning fifty. Meanwhile, all my friends are turning fifty too. <laughs> so like, what difference does it make? Or they've are they're already sixty. <laughs> For sure, for sure. So have you already started uh, thinking about the next album? No? No, something about releasing something that was so stylistically different from what we had done before that uh, I've been uh, kind of paralyzed in in writing because I'm like, where do we go from here? I don't know. So I think now that we've released the record and now that we're really like stepping into this role comfortably, um, I can already feel the, the, the wheels turning and, uh, I think we'll stay on this path for a little while. Um, mm-hmm. you know, we get bored pretty quickly, so who knows, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a good path though. I mean, it's, it's, you know, you've, you've kind of just barely scratched the surface of, of what you yeah. can do here. So there's plenty of, plenty of ground to run on yet. Absolutely. I think in a, in a lot of ways, we're just, we were waiting to see if we were going to get away with it. And like, if, if, if we would like, if, cause we feel really sincerely and really it feels really personal to do this but you know people don't always want what you have to offer them we've made records in the past that we felt really strongly about and realized that people just didn't want to hear it from us they didn't want to hear that thing from us and uh, and it turns out that at least so far people what they're saying is they they do want to hear this from us so that feels like maybe we're, we're going to be given the opportunity to do it more and if and if it and if so honestly i i the, th- the thought that we might just for henceforth be a country band like it almost brings me to tears because I just like what a goddamn joy that would be to, <laughs> yeah. to dig deep and to learn and to just continue to make like that. What a beautiful chapter of, of life would be to just be like from now on, it's all it, it's all Waylon Jennings and it's all Dolly Parton. Like, <laughs> fuck yeah. You, gotta get us. you can get Shooter to produce the next one. So that it'll all work out. Absolutely. 